information. Well, we also know, in fact, that one of the components of the diffusion model is that people don't automatically adopt a new idea of practice once they hear about it. They go through stages in the adoption process. And in the diffusion model, those stages were specified as the awareness stage, the persuasion stage, decision, implementation, and confirmation. And in fact, many behavior change models have stages of change to them. This table here from my 2002 book compares the different kinds of stage models that exist and show us how individuals move through different stages and what those stages might be. One of the innovations in behavioral science research has been to specify these different stages in the behavior change process and examine how quickly people move from one stage to another and tailor our behavior change interventions to the different stages at which people are in the change process. Well, if you combine the stages of change phenomenon, the fact that people are in different stages, and the diffusion process, one of the things that you get is this very well-known CAP curve, the knowledge, attitudes, and practice curves that exist for many different behaviors. So typically when we're doing behavioral science research, we try to measure people's knowledge and awareness of new ideas, their attitudes towards those ideas, and whether or not they practice them. And one of the things that we know, in fact, is that not only do diffusion of behavior follow this S-shaped curve, but you also have curves for knowledge, attitudes, and practices. And one of the things that we're interested in in behavioral science very often is to try to reduce the gap from knowledge to practice, this so-called cap gap, which is the distance it takes for per a person to first learn of something and then eventually to incorporate this new behavior uh, into routine practice and action. So how does diffusion work? Well, one of the things that we seem to uh, know that happens quite frequently is that diffusion of innovations occurs through a process whereby a new idea or practice comes from outside the community. The people on the margins of the community, number 14 in this example, are typically often the earliest innovators, the earliest ones to adopt the new idea because they're on the periphery of the network, on the margins if you will, and they're free to innovate. They're not constrained by the attitudes and opinions of everybody in this network because they're less connected to it. And given the fact that they're marginal in this network, they may have connections to other people in other networks. So oftentimes, people way out on the margins are the very first to innovate. They are the innovators. And then their behavior spreads to others that are more connected in the network. And once the diffusion, once the innovation reaches those more connected individuals at the center, then diffusion can occur more rapidly. So there is a two-step process here from the outside to people on the margins and then eventually to those that are more integrated and central in the network that will then generate more widespread and faster diffusion to everyone else. So there's a very complicated interplay that takes place here between number persons number 13 and 14. Where 13 may be willing to embrace the idea early but he or she has to gauge whether or not they think that uh, particular innovation or idea will be popular or compatible with their community. And once they get a sense that it may be compatible and, and culturally appropriate for the community to embrace the new idea, then the opinion leaders will embrace it and that will subsequently accelerate diffusion more rapidly. So there was considerable research on diffusion of innovations and an understanding of this general paradigm starting with Ryan and Gross in early studies and through the 1950s and 60s there was a dramatic increase in the number of uh, research studies on diffusion of innovations and eventually there was a diffusion of diffusion research from the US and European countries to developing countries. But you'll notice by this graph that by the end of the 1960s and the early 1970s study on the diffusion of innovations had almost entirely died off. There were very few diffusion studies. We have a paper, uh, Valenti and Rogers, that we published in 1995 documenting what we think are the reasons for this. But in short, people were not really investigating these network explanations for the diffusion of innovations. 
And so the ratio of diffusion publications to, uh, uh, and, and the number of research innovations to the number of pop publications um, was very small. And there weren't many new ideas being interjected into the study of diffusion of innovations. People did not know how to research the social networks which drive diffusion of innovations. And so uh, scholars no longer started to investigate uh, diffusion uh, subjects and studies. Well, as I said, the reason people did not investigate is because they really didn't know how to understand the social networks which are so critical to how diffusion occurs. Here is a graph of a simple social network. We asked students in sixth grade to name their closest friends and we graphed this network uh, as shapes. Girls are squares, um, boys are circles, and you can see at 12 years old in sixth grade, most of the friendship connections are within gender. Boys are more likely to be friends with boys and girls more likely to be friends with girls. And we have specific algorithms in the network analysis community to identify different positions in this network. We can identify people who are group members. We can identify people on the margins, on the periphery. We can identify central members these key individuals that are very important to the flow of information and perhaps setting cultural norms in the community. And we can identify bridges, which are important conduits for ideas and practices to spread between groups uh, and subgroups in the network. Understanding this network, its mathematical, cultural, social, communication properties, is very important for understanding how ideas and practices will spread through this community, through this classroom, and through, through these friendships. There, in fact, is an entire community of social network analysts known as the International Network for Social Network Analysis. It has been evolving so that it can map and analyze and understand ever more complicated network structures and link those network structures to different kinds of behavioral phenomenon. We are getting much better at specifying how social networks structure the spread and diffusion of new ideas and practices. Social network analysis has been around for a long time. Early pioneers uh, in the early 1900s up until the 1930s did some groundbreaking social network research, but there were few of them. In the 30s and 40s, there was some development of a science of social network analysis, and in the 50s and 60s, a lot of researchers were already putting forward novel algorithms and computational techniques for understanding what social networks looks like. From the 1970s up until the early 1990s, there was a um, fairly small group of social network analysts. The uh, INSNA organization had been formed, journals had been established, and this group met regularly to discuss research topics in social network analysis. Most of the investigations, the empirical ones, were of smaller networks. The computing capabilities at that time generally only permitted the study of groups of 40, 60, maybe 100 or so social networks networks. By the 1990s, um, there was considerable interest in using social network analysis to understand the spread of STDs and HIV and other public health phenomenon. And around the turn of the century, uh, massive computing capabilities became available. Computer scientists and physicists began to bring their considerable power and tools to the analysis of large social networks. And so now the tools are available to analyze very large networks and many new algorithms and scientific insights are being put forward by an ever-growing community. Again, for me, this community is organized largely around INSNA, the International Network for Social Network Analysis, INSNA.org. Well, there was a groundbreaking paper published in 2007 by Christakis and Fowler that really put network analysis on the map, both in the popular imagination as well as the scientific community. Christakis and Fowler analyzed a very large uh, social network, people who had participated in the Framingham Heart Health Study over a number of decades, and showed that obesity, as well as many other things, spread through this social network. And that paper was very influential in making us understand that social network effects are very real. They affect not only infectious disease, but also chronic conditions. So viruses, flus, and colds all spread through social networks, but so does obesity, happiness, smoking, and other, um, other chronic conditions and behaviors.